Amen. Here at Crossbridge, that's exactly what we believe, no matter what happens in our life. A lot of times we look at our lives and we say, wow, that's great. I'm so excited. That good thing happened in my life. But then when tragedy comes, uh, we might be tempted to say, well, I just want to get past that. But we have to understand God is good no matter what. God is good in the good and in the bad, as it were. And God has a plan and a purpose for our lives we're so excited, especially if you're here today and, and this is your first time worshiping with us. If you're a parent of one of these amazing children, you know, what's so incredible, and this is something that I dealt with, uh, with, with our parents this week in the class we were talking about, that Jesus said very clearly that we need to come to him as a child, as a child. And what he's talking about is the reality of faith, faith. You know, as parents, if we say something to our children, uh, they trust us. They believe we have their best. And so they're going to believe us no matter what. And we talked about this week with parents, the responsibility that each parent has to fulfill that picture of that image of God in the life of their child. And that's what parents do. We're called to be God's representative, God's bridge for our children. Now, as we, quote unquote, get older and more sophisticated, the Bible tells us in a book called Romans in the New Testament, a guy named Paul writing says that we suppress the truth about God in our own unrighteousness. That's why Jesus says we need to come to him as a child. So I thought it would be fitting today before we go and release you outside to everything that's going to be going on out there. I thought it would be fitting to take one of the Bible passages that the children dealt with this week. It was a core Bible passage that was wrapped up inside of Vacation Bible School. And I wanted to address all of us with this because it is truly a profound event. Not only in the life of Jesus, but in the life of his disciples. And all of us, no matter what age we are, we always desire, we want to find ourselves in such a place where we are looking for direction, looking for purpose. We want to make sure that we know that there's a purpose for our life and for our existence. Thank you, Josh. I appreciate that. And so, in this case, today I want to talk about understanding authentic faith. Faith, just like coming to him as a child, and that leads to purpose in our life. Uh, We have all kinds of things that we focus on in life, and sometimes I think we get to a place where we feel like we're wandering aimlessly. But today, I promise you, God's Word unpacks for us the reality of discovering purpose. Today's passage of Scripture, in my opinion, gives one of the clearest definitions of what we define as faith. Faith is not some sort of just wispy, mystical thing. Faith is absolutely a belief and a trust, and it's not having, quote-unquote, faith that is important. It's the object of the faith that we exercise. And so take your Bible. These scripture passages will be on the screen as well. If you don't have a Bible, I often say this to anybody that comes into this church. There are Bibles in front of you in the pew. If you don't have a Bible, you need one. Feel free to take one of those. That's okay. Everyone should have a Bible. God's Word. I am in the fifth chapter of what we call the Gospel of Luke. It's the third book in what we call the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, this is what the text says. Now it came about that while the multitude were pressing around him, that him is Jesus, and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret or the Sea of Galilee. And And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, But the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked, put out a little way in from the land. And he sat down and he began teaching the multitudes from the boat. 
And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. But at your bidding, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. And they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear. From now on you will be catching men. And when they brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. It's an amazing gift that you have left us that we can study, understand, listen, hear from you, specifically from your heart in your word. Lord, I thank you for every person that's in this room. I thank you for every parent, for every child, for every grandparent, for everyone who is here today. And Father, I pray that in these last remaining moments of this service, you will speak clearly to our hearts. May this be a day that is, is, is different from any other, and may you change us completely from the inside out. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, and for his sake, amen. As I said, it has been a privilege and honor to minister each night to your children this week, if you're a parent. Thank you for entrusting us. What you're about ready to hear is the core of what we wanted them to take away from this week, and that's why I'm doing this today. I want you to walk out of this room with the same idea, the same concept. I want you to know that God who gave you breath God who causes the blood to surge through your veins loves you more than you could ever dream or imagine. Now you might be tempted to say, wow, you don't know my life. My life is anything but but easy and I can't imagine a God that loves me. Maybe it's because you've not connected to Him in the way that He's encouraging us to connect to Him. And today, uh, this passage of Scripture shows us that very clearly. The first thing that I want us to see out of this text is the reality of defining faith. How do you give biblical faith? That's what, when I'm not just talking about, you know, you walk into a, a restaurant and you eat the food that's put in front of you, trusting, whether you realize it or not, that your waiter or, or, or your cook had a good day. Maybe they're having a bad day. I won't go there, but we exercise faith all the time. You get on airplanes. And you trust that the pilot was trained properly. You don't ask questions. Most of us never get to meet the pilot. We just trust it. That's exercising faith. But here we're talking about authentic faith, true faith, and the greatest of all objects in God himself and Jesus. How do you define it? The first thing that I want you to understand about the definition of faith, and this is going to be on your screen. First, you have to know what God wants you to do. You have to know what God wants you to do. Now, just a couple weeks ago, it's hard for me to imagine, I'm I'm sitting here and I'm reading this text, and just a couple weeks ago, I was actually sitting with a group of folks from our church family along the side of this sea. We were doing Bible studies, it's actually a lake, here it's called the Lake of Gennesaret, but the Sea of Galilee is what we're talking about here. We were sitting on the shoreline of that lake at a hotel we were staying in and doing Bible study right there. A similar picture as to what's happening here, except Jesus had multitudes that were listening to him. Verse 1, that we are told they were pressing in and listening to the word of God. Now, in that same book, the book of Romans that I referenced earlier, the apostle Paul says something else in chapter 10, and it's actually verse 17. He says, faith comes by hearing... And hearing comes by the Word of God. So if we're going to exercise authentic faith, it's got to come by hearing God's 
word. So this is exactly where you find yourself today. We're in Boca Raton sitting in a building here on Crossbridge campus, but it's no different than what you see happening here. God's word has been open. We've read it. We're sharing it. The potential for authentic faith is here. I don't know what you came in this room today with. I don't know what you're struggling with. Maybe you say, Rob, you don't even understand how challenging it is for me every day. Just just keeping my family afloat. Listen, I, I, I get it. But, but the same faith that operated in this text is the same potential faith that can operate in this room. Jesus is your answer. So the only way we can really know what God wants us to do is by hearing from Him and His Word. Now when you look specifically at verse 4, you see that element in this text. Jesus tells Simon Peter, put out your nets into the deep water for a catch. That's what Jesus says to do. So in order for you and I to have authentic faith operating in our lives, our ears have to be open to hearing from God. If we're closed off, if we think we've got it figured out, or we're not really sure if God's really there, whatever the case might be, then we're not going to have the potential for authentic faith. Jesus has to get to us through his word. That's one of the coolest, most amazing things about the fact you're here. I don't know where you are in life, but at least you're here. And you're listening to the word of God, which means the potential for this is happening right now. Will you listen? Will you be open to it? So we got to know what God wants us to do. The second thing in this definition of authentic faith, we have to know what God wants us to do despite the circumstances. Now I get it. We don't know the future. We can't know the future. We're kind of just, you know, we can plan, we can strategize, we, we can assume what we think and how things are going to turn out. But ultimately, we don't know. We don't know what tomorrow holds. And so oftentimes, we'll end up trying to make decisions based on the circumstances that surround our lives. Now, I've been taking the Crossbridge Church on, uh, on, as a whole the past several weeks through a study in the Old Testament in a character's life named Joseph. Joseph shows us very clearly that we need to listen to God and, and go forward with him despite what the circumstances are. Because his circumstances are anything but ideal. And we learned last week his dad is, is living a, a life for 20-some years of a lie, believing something that really isn't true and making decisions that way. So if we're going to exercise authentic faith, we have to know what God wants us to do despite the circumstances. Look at the first part of verse 5. Simon says, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. That's the circumstances. And they're tired. And they're already folding the nets up. They've already convinced themselves, man, this, was, this, this night stinks, and so we're just going to put it away, and we'll come back for another catch some other time. Now, you need to understand something about Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, John. All these guys were fishermen. That was their occupation. They knew that lake better than anyone. They knew where the, the, the sweet spots were. They knew where the fish would gather. They knew when, when to go and where to go at specific times and specific places. So, if you will, you're reading between the lines in, in Peter's comment to Jesus, right? Peter was so kind as to allow Jesus to step into his boat and push off the shore for just a little bit because the crowd was so big. That was the only way Jesus could kind of get, get some space so he could talk to the crowd. So Peter was kind to let him do that. And then when Jesus says, hey, go out into the deep water, drop the nets. You kind of get this inference where Peter, without saying it, is saying, okay, right, uh, we're the fishermen, you're the preacher, you stick to what you do and we'll stick to what we do, right? The circumstances are, we fished hard all night and caught nothing, please give me a break. That's the inference, even though the text doesn't tell us that, that's the circumstances. But... Let me give you the last word in our definition of faith. We know what God wants us to do despite the circumstances. And here's the third part of that definition. We obey. We obey. The second part of verse 5. Look what it says. But at your bidding, I will let down the nets. 
So you get this image where Peter's saying, Oh, Jesus, we fished hard all night and caught nothing. And then this long pause. <laughs> you know, he's kind of waiting on Jesus to respond to say something back, kind of like, okay, get it. Come back for another one. But Jesus doesn't say anything. I just get the picture in my mind of Jesus just staring at him. Yeah? So what? <laughs> Go out to the deep water! So finally, Peter, being polite, however you want to say it, he says, oh, okay, but at your bidding. Guys, get the nets. Let's go. It's amazing. It's amazing. And what happens next, so that's defining faith. Let me say it again. Know what God wants you to do. The only way to do that is to know his word. Get in his word. That's what we did with your children all week long. Expose them to this word, this word that comes from God and God alone. Know what God wants you to do despite circumstances. Don't let the circumstances guide you. Let God's word guide you no matter what. And then obey. Just do what it says. What's the result? Well, here's the second part of my message this morning. The result is an unbelievable outcome. We read it, didn't we, in verse 6. When they did it, when they obeyed, (laughs) They enclosed a great quantity of fish until their nets begin to break. Now, you, this is like craziness. This is like such an understatement. These guys made a living. Let me, let me just say that again. These guys made their living by fishing. So they're catching a great catch like this. You can just hear the dollar signs, cha-ching, cha-ching. I mean, it's amazing. They're, look at this. I mean, they're going to have to, they're going to have enough fish so their family will be supported for a year. This is like crazy stuff, right? It's unbelievable when we do what the Word of God tells us to do. When we listen, despite the circumstances, when we obey, no matter what we deem the outcome, it will become an amazing outcome. Then we see the second part of this. Not only is it an unbelievable outcome, but others share in the joy. In verse 7, Simon, he signals to their partners in the other boat. They had two boats. Remember, that's what the text told us. He says, come over here. we got to have help, right? And they came and filled both boats so that they, be- they began to sink. Can you imagine? I mean, let that sink in for just a minute. How many fish? This, this had to be a wild scene. You know how fish are. If you ever fit, jumping everywhere, they're trying to drag the nets in. They get them in the boat. The fish are jumping and hopping. There's nowhere to stand. The boats are starting to go underwater. It's amazing. You can imagine. Now, remember. There's a multitude of people standing around watching all this. So the more they begin to see this, the, the, the air gets electric. People, are, look at that. Can you believe it? Look what's going on out here. The disciples who make their living catching fish, they're like, this is nuts. This is craziness. Right? When you and I know what God wants us to do, Despite the circumstances, when we obey Him and God begins to do this massive, amazing change in our life, then others begin to share in the benefit of that, just like these other fishermen. Yes, Jesus told Simon to do it, but because Simon is obeying, everyone else gets to share in the joy. It's an incredible, incredible truth. Then, here's the the amazing piece of this, right? Right? Every time I read this, no matter how much I teach it, no matter how much I've read it before, it shocks me, this part of the story. The third thing, when we understand the result of defining faith in our life, this reveals who God really is and who we really are. Where do I get that? Well, in verse 8, right? You would assume... With everything that's going on and the energy and the excitement of the moment, you would assume that Simon Peter would be just, wow. Ho, ho! I mean, you can imagine everybody's high-fiving, everybody's screaming, everybody's yelling, everybody's clapping. You know, they're they're shouting louder than the children shouted. Because what's going on? It's incredible. So you would assume Peter's like starting to think, right? He's a good fisherman. He gets it. He's probably starting to think, hey, Jesus, maybe you should go on these trips with me more often. Right? I could use a partner like you. You you would think that would be his natural response. 
But the way that Jesus, uh, after Jesus says this, the way Peter responds to me is breathtaking. We're told that in verse 8, Simon Peter saw all of this taking place and he bows down, he falls at Jesus' feet. But it's not just like, okay, this is amazing, Jesus. He says something very strange. This is is the Jesus that just caused this massive, incredible fish situation because, by the way, he's the creator of the fish and the fish will do what he asks them to do. He tells them to jump in the net. They're jumping in the net because he's the creator of the fish. And so when Peter falls down, he recognizes something. Those fish are more obedient than he is. Did you catch that? When Jesus tells his fish, get in the net, they don't question. They don't talk back. And so Peter begins to realize something about himself. He says, get away from me, for I am a sinful man. What's that got to do with anything? Peter recognizes he's in the presence of something he cannot define. He cannot understand. He's beginning to see, whoa, his picture of God is way too small. He sees Jesus, and all of a sudden, it reflects back on him at how sinful he actually is. Beloved, if you and I get to this place where we think somehow we deserve this, like God owes us eternal life, that Jesus died for us, yeah, he should have. If we are in that place, we don't know ourselves and we don't know God. We don't understand just how pervasive sin in our life actually is and how greatly we need the mercy and the grace of a God who spreads out His hands on a cross and He, and he pays the ultimate penalty for your sin and mine. Jesus didn't do anything wrong. You and I did. The people that live at that moment did. He died for your sin and mine, not His own. And because of that, He loves you. And so Peter is seeing this. And he recognizes that he's in the presence of God. Get away from me. I'm a sinful man. Get out of here. It's like Isaiah chapter 6 in the Old Testament where Isaiah catches a vision of God and all of a sudden this prophet who from most people's perspective would be very righteous says, whoa, I'm, I'm undone, I'm flipped inside out, I can't take this, I can't stand it. God, get away from me in essence. I'm, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. Our lips are tied to our hearts. What's in here ultimately comes out here. You can't hide it forever. That's the point. And so Peter's doing the same thing. Get out of here, Jesus. I can't take it. You're too holy. You're too amazing. You're too incredible. I cannot stand this because it's too painful for me. I realize just what a wretch I actually am. You know, we're told in the book of the Old Testament book of Proverbs, chapter 9 and verse 10, this scripture should be on your screen. Um, maybe not. Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10, let me read it. In Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10, the scripture says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. You see, when we come to that place where we begin to fear God, not just out of a terror, but out of respect, out of how much different He really is than us, that is the beginning of wisdom. And that is exactly what Peter was experiencing. Then fourthly, when we look at the result of this, it reveals, and here's where I get the title for my message, it reveals the purpose for my life. It's the second part of verse 10 there in that text that we read. See, Peter is on his face in front of Jesus. He can't even look at Jesus. He's just telling Jesus, get out of here. I'm a sinful man. I can't take it. I can't take it. But Jesus doesn't leave him like that. Jesus says, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. His purpose is revealed. This is the true life purpose for Simon Peter. He was not meant to be a fisherman. God used the fact that he was a fisherman to prepare him for something greater. But his ultimate purpose in life was to catch you and me. Do you realize what's interesting? If you're in this room and you're not Jewish, and if you don't know for certain, that means you're not, you're Gentile. This was a struggle in the early church. 
And one of the first apostles, one of the first, and Peter was the leader of the disciples, to be given a vision to reach the Gentile nations with the gospel happened through the apostle Peter. I'm sure when that happened in his life, he was reflecting back on this, I will make you a fisher of men. You want to know what your purpose is in life? Well, you got to know what God wants you to do despite the circumstances and obey. That's how you come to the place where you realize, that's why I was put here on this earth. That's what I'm here for. One last thing I want to say before I let you all go this morning. The third key factor in this text is a biblical principle that we see all throughout the Scripture. It doesn't make sense according to this world. The world says you got to get all you can get while you can get it and get it now. You know, the old bumper sticker, I'm probably going to date myself, but he who has the most toys when he dies wins. That is the world's mantra. But that is a joke. That is like so empty. There's nothing there. That is leading to destruction. The biblical principle, the, the principle of God's kingdom says you've got to lose to gain. And you see that in verse 11. We learn that after this event, instead of sticking around and hanging out and fishing for what they've always done and just making money for that particular time period, the Bible says they left everything and followed Jesus. You and I have to come to a place in our life if there's going to be real purpose, real meaning, if we're going to exercise authentic faith where we drop it all, no matter what, lose it all to follow Jesus. Now here's the great thing. Jesus says in Matthew 6.33, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and then everything else will be added unto you. Parents, that means that you have to lose your children. They don't belong to you in the first place. We've been, we've been talking about that all week. They're just on loan to us by God. We're God's representative to them. We have to lose them. Husbands, wives, you've got to lose your spouse. It's not about them. It's about Jesus. Your family, you've got to lose them. Your job, give it up because Jesus is the ultimate goal. He puts you in that job. He can keep you in that job. He can give you another job. The job that we have is not a means to an end to make money for our family. Yes, God uses those things to do that, but it's a place where we can be His representative where we find ourselves. Lose it all. Your house doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. Your bank account, it's not yours. God gave you that. He can take it away. It's all God's. And when we come to that place where we lose it all, that's where we gain it all. We lose it all to gain it all. Have you connected to a principle like that in your life? You say, okay, Rob, nice What's all this have to do with my particular life? What am I supposed to do today to exercise true faith? Well, let me tell you something. I'm going to give you the definition one more time. Know what God wants you to do despite the circumstances and obey. First and foremost, God's word says this. This is what you have to do. You have to die to yourself and be made alive to Christ. How is that possible, you say? Well, Recognize the fact that no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter what you have, everything has been given to you by the grace and the mercy of God. Surrender, like Peter, surrender to God's plan in your life. The Bible says if you will confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, that's the word of God. That's what you have to hear. Confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, meaning... He's in control. You and I are not. That's what he's asking you to do. Despite the circumstances, you say, I'm the guy that's, or the gal that's, you know, going to work every day, that's making sure my kids are fed, that's getting them to school, that's doing all this kind of stuff. I'm in control. No. That's what the circumstances may say. Don't listen to the circumstances. Confess Jesus as Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Wait a minute. You know, dead people don't rise again. Yes, they do. Jesus is the first. And if you and I will put our faith and our trust in Him, then you too will rise again. The resurrection of God can apply to your life and to mine. You know that deep down. We always kick against death, and yet every one of us dies. Every one of us. 
Why is that? That's because sin is universal. But don't look at the circumstances. Despite the fact that everybody dies, you can live again always and forever in resurrection if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And then you obey. You just step out despite what your friends might say, despite what your spouse might say, despite what your coworkers might say. You follow. You leave it all and you follow. And if you do that, beloved... I'm not standing up here trying to pretend it make your life easy. Anything but that. But what I am saying is it connects you to purpose. It connects you to something deeper than just what I got to do today. It connects you to future and vision and, and, and eternality in your life. So today, if you're in this room and you've never truly followed Jesus like that, I first want to invite you to do that. If you're a believer already in Jesus, what you got to do, just like you did when you believed in Jesus, follow him. Leave it all to follow him. Here at Crossbridge, we believe in prayer. Yes, there's buckets and balloons and all that in front of our altars. That's fine. You just come as God would lead you. We want you to pray. Right now, I want to ask all of you, if you just will, for just a moment. I did this on the last night, on Thursday night with your children, and I want to do it right here one more time. Bow your heads with me, please. Close your eyes. Kids, children, if you would, just give me a minute. Shh, just a minute, okay? Because this is a really amazing, important time. You know, I get it. It's chaotic some in this, in this room this morning, and, and we wonder about all of this, and maybe what I said is interesting, but you're not sure about it all. I want you for just a moment to see if you don't hear the Word of God speak. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by God's Word. We've said everything we've had to say. Now it's time for your response with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're in this room, I'm not going to point you out. I'm not going to call your name, nothing like that. But if you're in this room and you want today to give your heart to Jesus. It makes sense to you what it means to confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. If you want to have a personal relationship with Jesus, every head bowed, every eye closed, just slip your hand up. Thank you, anyone else? Thank you, thank you, anyone else? Thank you, anyone else? Thank you. I'm not gonna call your name, nothing like that. Okay, you know who you are, okay? Listen, if you will obey that, that is the most important decision you will ever make, ever. You want to be a better husband? Follow Jesus. You want to be a better wife? Follow Jesus. You want to be a better parent? Put Jesus first in your life before everything. You want to be a good worker, a nice employee, a good manager, a great owner, all the things that we are follow Jesus first. If you had your hand up in just a, a moment ago, in a moment we're going to stand and we're going to sing. I'm going to invite every one of you, if you raised your hand, to come down and let me or one of the staff, we have deacons here at the church, let one of them know. We'll tell you what next. What do you got to do? We'll pray with you. We'll be here for you. If you're in this room and you say, Rob, look, I did that. I asked Jesus to be my Lord, but my life is all a mess. My priorities are out of whack. Maybe you're looking at circumstances instead of listening by faith. If you're a child of God in this room and you need to connect to that purpose that I'm talking about, again, there'll be people up here that'll be willing to pray with you. The altar is here. You can come and pray. We believe in prayer. If you're a, a parent with your children and you want God to be the center of your home, then bring your family forward. Come and pray as a family. Make a statement here today. As Pastor Scott said earlier, we as a church cannot be the primary disciples. You have to be that. Your home has to be the central resource where kids and, and you guys as parents grow close to Jesus. Every day. You maybe walk on this campus once, twice a week. This needs to happen every day. So make that statement today by coming to pray as a family. I don't know. If you're here today and you want to follow deeper in your walk with Christ, you've never been baptized. It's not baptism that saves you. It's an outward statement of your faith. You can come and let us know that. Maybe you say, Rob, 
I've been looking for a church, a place where I need to connect, get my family involved. And I'm convinced God is saying to me, this is the church I need to bring my family to. We'd be honored to receive you in a part of our family. Whatever God is doing, you respond, Father, you're awesome, God. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love. Thank you for your word. Thank you for every person that's here. And Lord, as we go into this time, we call invitation. I pray that if you put it on the heart of somebody to come forward, to make public the decision that they've been wrestling with this morning, to pray at the altar, to speak to me or one of the staff or deacons, Lord, give the courage where it's necessary and needed. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you. For it's in your name we pray and for your sake. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet as Pastor Nay leads us. You respond as God leads. Let's sing, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my hand, I will see of the goodness of your God all my life all my life you have been you some of you this morning I want to challenge you stop letting the world define what is good listen to the song you're singing God is always good despite what we deal with in our life sometimes his good can be incredibly painful but it's preparing us for something greater today the altar still open we're gonna sing through that one more time I want to challenge you if you need to pray if you need to come forward these altars are open. We've got leaders that will receive you. Otherwise, just sing as a prayer this song to God. God is good all the time. Pastor Nay. Let's sing chorus one more time. All my life. All my life you have been faithful. I want us to keep uh, worshiping a little bit. I know we want to get outside and all of that, but God's doing something. Several folks came forward to pray. 
getting the opportunity to pray with a young man about Jesus. It's awesome. It's the greatest decision we'll ever make in our life. It never ceases to amaze me, the truth of Jesus saying, if we come to him like a child, how he responds to the power of that. So, one more time, and then we'll close our service. The altar's still open. If you need to pray, if you need to talk to me or someone else, feel free to come down. Pastor Nate. Second verse. I love your voice. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. Many are calm, they've prayed. Um, if you need to talk to one of us, please grab us after the service. I'm so excited about what God is doing this morning. Um, we'll be outside. Please make sure you grab one of us. It is my pleasure, my privilege, and my honor to know God is working in the lives that He's working in here this morning. Crossbridge is an amazing church, and God is doing some really incredible things here. And you are all welcome to be a part of that every week. Thank you for being a part of our worship service today. I'm going to ask Brother Edmund to come and close us in a word of prayer. As, I, as Pastor Scott said earlier, when we dismiss from here, you're going to go immediately out the doors in the back to the right. And that's where all the activities are going to happen over in the, the parking lot over there. Thank you. Thank you for being obedient. And as I said, if you need to talk to me, any of the staff, we're there, we'll be around. I encourage you to do that. God bless you. Brother Edmund.